Thank you, John. Welcome everyone to tonight's book launch for a very exciting book entitled, maybe with the most important phrase of our time, making climate policy work. And our subject today is to look at one of the dominant climate policies we've seen trying to work over the past several decades of climate action, carbon markets, carbon pricing. Can these approaches be an effective part of our solution to this fundamental, important, critical problem? Um, I'm delighted that we have the book's authors with us tonight, plus some excellent discussants and commentators to look at these topics and to try to give us a better sense of how we approach this critical question, how it's worked so far, and how we can make it work better going forward. Um, and delighted to have so many of you joining us virtually here in our virtual uh, seminar room to talk through these topics. So the seminar will, will begin with some comments from, uh, from us in Oxford, then a presentation of the book's arguments, some discussion comments, and then importantly, a lot of question and answer. And we'll look forward to keeping your questions and answers um, to be a major part of our focus tonight. And you can use the question and answer function in the Zoom call to make those points. Um, so please be thinking about your questions already and fill that, that question and answer bar up as we go forward. Let me start though with some introductions. My name is Thomas Hale. I'm an associate professor at the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford University and a, a, a keen student of climate policy around the world. Um, I'm delighted though, this, this book launch is hosted not just by the Blavatnik School of Government, but by two other parts of Oxford University, including the Smith School of Enterprise and Environment and the Institute for New Economic Thinking. And for those of you who know Oxford, you'll know that actually getting three different parts of Oxford to collaborate on a single event is a very rare and very important achievement. And so it's a testament to our subject tonight and to the authors of the book we're gonna launch that they have achieved this. So if you can make this work, Danny and David, you can make certainly climate policy work, I would hope. Um, let me start by introducing the authors and then I'll, I'll turn to the rest of the agenda. So the first author is Danny Cullen Ward, who is an, an energy, energy economist and lawyer working on the design and implementation of scientifically grounded climate policy. He's a policy director at Carbon Plan and in the California Senate is appointee to something called the Independent Emissions Market Advisory Committee, which is a key regulatory body deciding on market-based climate policies for one of the largest climate carbon markets in the world. Um, and Danny is both a lawyer and an economist, so it brings a unique view of these issues from the perspective of markets, but also from the perspective of regulation and law and how we make these two things come together in an effective way. Danny, it's wonderful to have you with us tonight. We're also, the other author of the book is David Victor. David is Professor of Industrial Organization and Innovation at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at the University of California, San Diego. And David is really a, a, one of the leading thought thinkers on climate policy um, we have in the world today. Someone who's thought about this from a whole range of perspectives from a possibly wide set of subject matters. So um, we're, we're really lucky to have his thoughts on this quintessentially, uh, this is essentially important climate policy, carbon pricing as well. And just to note, for those of you who might be joining us from the Blavatnik School, you, you'll have read David's, uh, parts of David's book, Global Warming Gridlock, which is a seminal text in the discussion of climate policy. And I, I'm, I have a feeling that this new book from Danny and David on making climate policy work will be similarly influential in the field. So before we hear from them though, we're going to have a quick set of framing remarks from my colleague, Professor Cameron Hepburn. Cameron is the director of the Smith School of Enterprise and Environment, a key part of Oxford's thinking on uh, how we think about the intersection of markets and environmental issues and a, a, an economist who's made huge contributions to the understanding of how these different kinds of market mechanisms work and the theories around them um, and their successes and some of the limitations as well. And after we hear from Cameron, we'll go to the authors to have a, a presentation of the book's main arguments. And then we'll hear from our discussant who I'll introduce um, at the time. So as I said before, we're really excited and delighted to have these experts with us tonight. We're also delighted to have you joining us to hear about them. And we're looking forward to your comments in a few moments time. So without further ado, Cameron, over to you. Thanks, Tom, for a really lovely introduction. And Tom's absolutely right. It, it takes uh, a special book, special set of authors to get all the parts of Oxford collaborating uh, together here. So congratulations, Danny and David. You've really uh, hit the ball out of the park already before we even have what I'm sure is going to be an interesting discussion. And I'm here because I think this is one of the most important questions in climate policy. 
clearly, if you're here having followed climate change, you know that we are running out of time here. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic in reducing emissions is pretty big. And as you may know, we need to do that sort of reduction, 7.5% decline in emissions per annum year on year for the next 10 years to get us on track for a sort of rough one and a half degree target. So we are really nowhere near on track for either the, the pace required or the, the scale of the change required. And in that context, there's an awful lot of work obviously at Oxford going on around you know, how we accelerate change, a lot of INET, a lot of the Martin School, the Blavatnik School and the Smith School on sensitive intervention points, on the different uh, versions of catalytic cooperation, Tom, uh, and uh, you know, how, how do we get there? And what role does carbon pricing play here? Now, understandably, because it's Oxford, uh, you've got almost as many views on carbon pricing as there are scholars thinking about the issue. Um, you know, we've published amazingly, again, collectively on some of these points, how to make carbon pricing work for citizens in nature climate change. We edited a special issue on carbon pricing with uh, Nick Stern and Joe Stiglitz in the European Economic Review recently, but the, all these efforts really come down to the question, is carbon pricing the only game in town? Clearly it isn't, but maybe it's the main game in town. Our colleague Dieter Helm, also at the Vatnik School, in his book Net Zero, kind of more or less advances that view. Or is it an important game in town? One of a multiplicity of levers, but one that shouldn't be ignored because Perhaps to use Eric Beinhocker's language, it changes the fitness landscape of the different possibilities available to firms in the economy. Is it perhaps not an important game, but it's you know, a useful contributing element? And I guess I'd roughly characterize uh, David and Danny's position as being somewhere there, somewhere between useful and important. Or and perhaps I'm overstating it, perhaps it's a Potemkin market that actually is worse than useless. It gives the appearance of doing something when in fact, uh, is not really doing anything. Now, as we move into the, the process ahead for COP26, and as countries put their nationally determined contributions on the table, so putting some flesh on the bones of these net zero commitments that we're getting, how important will carbon pricing be and how important should it be? And I'm here uh, tonight to get a better sense of the right answer to that question. I don't think there's anybody better than uh, Danny and David to answer that question. I have had the privilege of uh, publishing with them before, and uh, these are sharp minds, sharp thinkers, practical and well focused. And I'm really looking forward to the conversation uh, this evening. So I think, David, I'm handing over to you to kick us off. Thanks. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction, uh, both Cameron and Tom. And thank you for the opportunity to contribute to getting different parts of a university to work together. Having spent a lot of my career in a university, I know how difficult that is. So climate policy should be a breeze now that we've had success on that on that front. Um, I, I want to talk, I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes about the big picture and some of the initial insights from the work that we're doing. And then I'm going to hand the floor over to, to Danny. You know, there's a lot of reasons why the world has not yet gotten serious enough about climate and time is time is running out. And this book is about one of those, which is that maybe we've not thought about the politics of the major instruments in the right way, the major policy instruments in the right way, in particular around market pricing, a cap and trade uh, um, and carbon taxation. And this is not a pro market book or an anti market book. It's just it's a clinical book. It's an empirical book um, that's guided by by a theory of the world. And I'll talk about that in a moment. And the nice thing about carbon pricing is we've been at this for two decades, plus or minus. And so there's a whole lot of data, and a lot of experiences that with which we can test our theories and develop some ideas. And I think Cameron, you've summarized it very nicely. We don't think carbon pricing is the main show. We think it's an important and useful part of the show and could be more useful and important with the, with the right kinds of reforms and, and logic, in particular around taxation and less on the cap and trade. And we'll talk a little bit about that and the book has a lot more about that. So if Danny is gonna drive the ship here with the slides, if you could show the first, the first slide. Um, uh, and uh, this is a book coming out from Polity Press. Uh, just it just came out from Polity Press, and and you can buy it in uh, in Europe. You can't buy it physically in the United States because for some mystifying reason books can't travel across the Atlantic for two months. 
but you can buy it on, on Kindle in the United States. So I urge you to, to, to get a copy and we look forward to the debates. Um, this is, uh, what's the puzzle we're trying to explain? If you look on the left chart, you see data that's familiar to all of us from the World Bank about over time, which is the horizontal axis, the share of global annual emissions that are in one way or another covered by carbon pricing initiatives. So they're at least somehow, they're in from coming from countries where, where carbon pricing mechanisms are in place. And you see a big rise. You see the rise of the ETS in the middle 2000s. You see uh, California's program. We see now a program in China taking shape and so on. And so that seems to be an encouraging story uh, uh, around um, uh, around the use of carbon markets. On the right side, you see what I think matters more, which is price levels. And this is an image from our book based on some similar, similar World Bank data, uh, uh, work originally by Jesse Jenkins as well, which looks at the price levels. <clears throat> and price levels really matter because price levels reveal effort, what societies say they're willing to do in terms of using this mechanism to do something about the underlying problem. 87% of world emissions have essentially zero price. Uh, and then you see above that uh, emissions that are priced to less than $15 or so. Uh, $15 is kind of where the California market's bouncing around right now. You see the EU ETS above that. And you see a very small, tiny fraction of global emissions uh, that are at much higher price levels. Uh, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, uh, uh, not very many countries after, after that. <clears throat> it's not the case <clears throat> that the places that have low prices aren't doing anything. So take California, for example, prices right now about $16 a ton, up and down, big cratering during the pandemic. And yet when you look at the policy instruments that California is adopting uh, outside of the price mechanism, you see efforts that are 10 times the cost or more. Uh, right now in the transportation sector, we're doing a lot of things that are that are around $200 a ton. So much, much greater effort. They're just not using the cap and uh, trade mechanism. And the same is true for places like Norway that have much higher carbon prices. Uh, it's really interesting to observe the, the, the Norwegian investment in carbon capture and storage in the middle of a pandemic. Equinor, the Norwegian uh, state, uh, state oil company, did final investment decision around what's called Northern Lights, which is a big project involving two other major oil companies, oil and gas companies, or I should really call them gas and oil companies, plus support, direct support from the Norwegian government and the EU to build a system of capturing carbon around the North Sea, moving it by ship to common disposal points and then injecting it underground. Even in one of the highest carbon price markets in the world, the carbon price alone was not sufficient to make that project go. It required an industrial policy, if you like, around building a new uh, CCS industry. <clears throat> and the story goes on and on as we tell a lot, uh, tell a lot of these stories in the, in, in the, in the book. It's, it's that willingness by society to do something about the climate problem is rising, and that's really good news. And yet somehow they're not really doing most of the work using carbon pricing mechanisms. And that's what, it, what we're trying to explain explain here. And as Danny and I wrote this book, we, we started wondering, you know, is the problem here that, that folks, that the policymakers weren't, weren't awake during Economics 101 when you learned about market externalities and so on? And the answer, we think, is they were wide awake. They, lear they learned what, what they learned and they were horrified because the market, everything we like about market instruments, the transparency, flexibility, uh, ability to equalize marginal costs across the society is kind of a horror show if what you're worried about is managing political consequences of different uh, of, of different kinds of activities. So what's new in this book um, uh, that, that, that we offer? And we can go to the next slide now. What's new in this book is we look at the history of carbon pricing through a very simple model of politics because we think this model explains an awful lot of what we observe. We have five major actors, which are shown on the left side here. They're the general public voters. Um, the model works actually very well also in, in non-democratic systems where there's kind of logic of political survival, but still you have broad-based uh, uh, individuals, uh, well-organized emitting industries, emerging low carbon industries, uh, organized civil society, think NGOs and political leaders. And three of these groups we think actually do most of the work, explain most of the variation what we observe in the, in the real world. Um, voters are very sensitive to, to, to policies that affect visible costs like policies in transportation. Emitting industries are extremely well organized and they know what they like and what they don't like and that can sometimes make it very difficult to adopt policies that are adverse to their interests. It's a big role for political leadership uh, as well. And then we look at these different interest groups that, that in effect 
influence decisions through two major kinds of institutions. One of the institutions that, that govern which policies get chosen, uh, adoption rules. So if you have a very high hurdle for passing new, new laws and regulations, and not surprisingly, veto players get empowered by that high hurdle. Uh, this is one of the reasons why we see cap and trade systems in the EU and in California compared with tax instruments that we think would be more effective is because the hurdles for tax policy in much of the world are much higher than the hurdles for environmental policies, uh, which cap and trade is, is usually crafted, at least for, for decision making purposes as uh, in that way. Administrative cap capacity also really, uh, really matters a lot. Um, we, are, we have a tendency to think about uh, administrative capacity through the lens of does the government know enough about where admission, admissions are happening and can it apply the right kind of taxes and other mechanisms upstream and so on. And that, that plays a role. There's no question about that kind of good old fashioned administrative capacity. What we've found is that another kind of administrative capacity is even more important, which is the capacity of government to respond to organized uh, interest groups. Uh, and if a, if a group which is organized and doesn't want a policy or is concerned, for example, about the impact of their policy on their competitiveness uh, to, to compensate them in some way or protect them in some way. So look, for example, at Sweden, where the steel industry is in the process of making massive investments in developing low carbon steel alternatives. And yet they're also competing in a global commodity steel industry where you can't afford to be more expensive than your competitors. And so a big part of the success of that policy has been to, to organize uh, specific trade protections, specific compensations and industrial policies to make that feasible in a way that a, that, that a, mecha, that a mark, that the market mechanisms on their own would not um, uh, actually have that impact. So that's what we do that's, that's, that's new here is we apply this model of politics to the problem of, of uh, market instruments writ large. So let me just take it out for just a brief drive and then I'm gonna give the floor over to, to, to Danny. Uh, one of the things that we learned by doing this is that there's a big difference between um, the nominal price of carbon, which you read about if you just ask what's the price of carbon in Sweden or, or California and so on, and then the average price of carbon. And that's shown in these two lines here. This is based on work Jeffrey Dolphin and colleagues did originally at Cambridge, so apologies, I gather there's a rivalry between uh, Cambridge and Oxford. Terrific work that's been looking sector, sector by sector, the actual incidence of carbon pricing inside societies, uh, and then what that means for the average Average, uh, the average price of, of, of carbon. So this is really important because in trade exposed industries, for example, there are often exemptions and a variety of other things that lower the actual incidence of, of carbon pricing and provide a variety of other, uh, a variety of other uh, compensating mechanisms. So you should care a lot about this. You should care a lot about this in part because this tells you something that's important when we think about making border carbon adjustments. You should care a lot about this because the economic logic around carbon pricing is really is really beautiful, but then you've got all these politics that differ sector by sector, in part because the interest groups are organized differently by sector, and in part because the capacity of government to compensate varies by sector. This is one of the reasons why electricity uh, uh, companies often have the highest carbon prices, is because there are lots of, there are highly regulated industries to begin with, and lots of mechanisms exist to compensate them through tariff adjustments uh, and, and and so on. So I mentioned a little while ago that, that California, for example, is, is doing a lot, uh, uh, even though the posted carbon prices are very, very low. And that goes to a logic that we carry through the whole book, which is that um, most of the work, and there are a variety of different ways of me measuring this, most of the work for carbon pricing, most of the work for controlling emissions that we're observing in the world today is not being done by price instruments, but by regulatory and industrial policy instruments. And that really matters for carbon pricing in particular cap and trade systems, because if most of the work is being done by regulation, then a cap and trade system is in effect trading the residual that's left over. And so the prices that are being revealed by those mechanisms are lower than the real marginal effort. They are what, uh, what Cameron called Potemkin markets, meaning that the work is being done by stealthier regulations and the markets are creating the illusion of uh, market price when in reality, the work is being done in other ways. And that's really important for us to keep in mind if what we care about is rapid and deep reductions in emissions. So let me give the floor over now to Danny, who's gonna uh, continue and, and outline uh, some additional parts of our study. Thank you, David, and thanks to the Oxford hosts. Again, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you all. Um, 
I will be talking about just a couple of implications of this work to dive in a little on the issues that David has outlined. This concept of a Potemkin market is really at the core of a lot of our analysis of the politics of how markets work when they're layered against stronger forms of government action, including regulation, including subsidies, including public expenditures. Um, and I think one of the most important consequences of this system is that uh, we often have a tendency to focus on the mar marginal prices in the markets as a sign of what's going on, um, when in fact, as David has suggested, the regulations end up doing a lot more of the work. Um, that actually, I think, hides one of the most important pieces of the puzzle, which is how the revenues that are collected from market-based climate policies are appropriated and used throughout the world. And I'm showing here a figure or a set of figures uh, also from our book that are based on really an extraordinary study that a group of economists uh, out of the Institute for Climate Economics put together, ultimately under cover of a World Bank technical report. Um, and it's showing the, the, the breakdown of market revenues uh, across the two types of market-based policy instruments, carbon taxes and carbon markets, across the entire world. Um, and it's then looking within each of those two market segments um, at what we characterize as three different kinds of spending. And the three different kinds of spending are funds that go directly to the general fund of a jurisdiction. So for example, the French carbon tax goes primarily but not exclusively to the French general fund, the main general fund of the state. Um, there is some use of revenue recycling where carbon revenues are used to reduce other taxes in the economy or in some cases to provide direct expenditure transfers to households or firms. Um, but there's another equally important and potentially politically most relevant piece of the puzzle, and that's what we're calling green spending. And it's the notion that revenues that are brought into the government by auctioning allowances and cap and trade programs or by directly levying taxes in carbon taxes can raise actually a significant amount of money. And as of the survey uh, based on 2018 data, we're looking at something on the order of $45 billion a year, which in the grand scheme of the global economy isn't much, but if a big share of those expenditures are being sent to unlock the toughest pieces of the climate problem or to procure cost-effective mitigation, um, they can end up potentially making up for some of the gap in ambition that we've argued is a structural phenomenon in markets generally, and one that's just as challenging, although potentially uh, a little easier to surmount uh, when it comes to carbon taxes. Um, carbon markets in particular tend to be dominated by the green spending model. Uh, and we think that this is something that needs a lot more discussion and emphasis uh, in the world because most of the discussion of how carbon pricing systems and regulatory strategies interact is one in which we tell a virtuous story about uh, we get moving on carbon pricing that helps make regulation easier regulation working helps make carbon pricing easier success in the one leads to success in the other. Um, and in practice, we don't really think we observe that in very many places. Um, not only are our industries that are harmed by carbon prices very well organized to oppose that mobilization, but upstart industries that would benefit from higher carbon prices typically spend most of their time lobbying for direct regulation, for direct state support, for direct expenditures and subsidies. Uh, I rarely encounter low carbon industries advocating for higher carbon prices, not because they don't care, but because it's not the biggest bang for their buck. They start elsewhere. When we think about the connection between carbon markets uh, and the acceleration of clean industries and other regulatory systems, the real story is on revenue. And we think that that's something, again, that for a variety of reasons, including the politics of not wanting to talk about revenue as a primary means of accelerating the climate transition, people really haven't studied to the extent that we need to see it. Uh, and this data set from these, uh, these wonderful economists in Paris, it's an extraordinary contribution uh, and it's shocking that there's basically nothing else like it and very little literature around this around the world. The implications of looking at revenue, I think really tie together a big piece of our story. And what I'm showing you here is a comprehensive picture of, of if you like the economics of California's comprehensive climate strategy. Um, I'm gonna walk through each of the elements in this figure to describe what's going on and provide some context for uh, why these pieces matter and how they fit together. Starting on the left, we have the observed market prices in California's economy-wide cap and trade program, which have varied from about $10 to as, as high as $18 at their, at their basically recent uh, peak. Um, it's a very small spread. It's also a very low number that does very little to encourage much of anything in terms of shifting of behaviors or investment in new technology. That contrasts strongly with other regulatory programs we see in the state that are doing significant and larger amounts of work. 
The next two items, the state's renewable portfolio standard and its low carbon fuel standard are sector specific regulatory programs. In the case of the RPS, a policy to encourage renewable energy on the grid, which when it began in the early 2000s, uh, renewable energy was quite expensive and it cost frankly a fair bit of money to get that moving. Um, that's played a huge role in expanding the, uh, the portfolio of California's clean electricity resources. The low carbon fuel standard uh, is, a, is a sectoral trading program that's focused on transportation fuels. It currently trades at approximately $200 a ton of carbon um, of CO2, uh, more than 10 times the prevailing market price in the cap and trade program. That's where the real work is happening in the state of California on the regulatory side. It's not the cap and trade program. And I think all stakeholders in the California program know this. Um, next to that, we have a range of prices in the state's most recent official scoping plan. It's a strategy document for how to achieve its ambitious 2030 target, which is roughly comparable to that of the European Union. And in that plan, a series of measures are listed from anything with negative $300 a ton as a price all the way up to $200 a ton. The most interesting part of this puzzle, from my point of view, uh, are the dots shown on the right hand side of the figure. These are individual dots for expenditure programs that are funded by the state's cap and trade revenues. And we see a range uh, of programs from relatively cost-effective programs on the lower end, the minimum expenditures about $21 a ton, to things that clock in, frankly, they don't even list carbon prices for some things because there's no visible climate benefits to the programs that are listed. Even though the state law requires all of these programs to benefit the climate, on average, we see something costing close to $500 a ton. Um, I promise you there's expenditures uh, in this program that are targeting transformative and difficult questions of innovation where that marginal price is appropriate and effective for making a difference on the climate. I also promise you there's a lot of stuff in here that has nothing to do with climate at all, but it's all labeled together as green spending. Um, and in almost all jurisdictions, these kinds of expenditure programs have escaped a much more thorough systematic review of what's actually going on. The last point I wanna make uh, is, is, a, is a, a question related to carbon offsets, which we spend a lot of time talking about in the book. To be brutally honest, and I think it's time for a much franker conversation about the role of carbon offsets, we believe they've almost been universally used to water down the ambition of carbon pricing programs when you see them in mandatory cap and trade programs or potentially in carbon taxes. The emitters that use them demand quantity. They don't particularly care about quality and the sorts of people you would think who would be policing standards of quality typically don't show up. Some of them are often in on the systems that end up creating large volumes of low quality carbon offsets to reduce the carbon prices in these systems. Um, I'm showing here a very interesting figure from a great report that uh, the Oxford community, I think many of the people uh, in today's event had a hand in participating in. Um, framing this question of how to think about net zero emissions in the long term and a shift from crediting avoided emissions to carbon removal and a shift from avoided emissions and short term carbon storage to long term permanent carbon removal. If we need to think about negative emissions, which we almost certainly do for our more ambitious climate targets. Uh, and the thing I want to fl flag about this figure, uh, this is an excellent report for people who haven't read it. Um, one of the biggest challenges we have right now is we have a, a suite of um, pledges from companies and governments to think about net zero climate ambitions. The private market for offset credits is starting from a state of abject dysfunction. And a lot of the, what's shown here in the figure on the top left, these credits for avoided emissions um, and short-lived storage or carbon removal with short-lived storage, these are often projects we see in the private market that are very, very low quality, that are not real at all. And if we are really going to get started on a path as this project uh, anticipates we need to, and I certainly believe we need to, I think we need to take really seriously that the legacy offsets industry was born of an effort to weaken climate policy, not to strengthen it. Uh, and that those in the private markets who want to do a better job have an uphill battle and they're going to need very active support to do that job well. Um, the last thing I'll say here, and I'll close out and, and, and welcome uh, Suganda's uh, response and discussion to the book. Um, we have four main high-level messages. Um, the first is, when you think about carbon pricing, focus on sectoral policies, not economy-wide policies. And the reason is, as David has articulated, multi-sector programs make it hard to navigate the politics. Single-sector programs make it easier to navigate the politics. That's quite literally the opposite of what economic theory would tell us but that's what political practice tells us is functional in the real world. The second main insight is when it comes to interactions between carbon prices and regulations, those interactions work better with carbon taxes. Carbon markets end up trading the residual. They always end up weaker and subsidiary to the regulatory instruments with which they're paired. 
Karma taxes don't have that liability and become much more politically tractable to manage in practice as a result of it. Getting either over the hurdle line to making, making law is a difficult challenge, but in practice, the taxes play better with the stronger regulations. The third major insight is that industrial policy and regulatory strategy is really the future in our view. It's where the bulk of the action will be in this field. That is not to say carbon prices don't matter or that we shouldn't try to strengthen them. We spend a great deal of time in the book working on efforts to strengthen the policy programs we criticize using the same political insights we draw on uh, to, to raise our concerns in the first place. And the last thing is that when it comes to overall climate strategy and long-term carbon neutrality goals, direct reductions are the game. Carbon offsets have generally been a challenge and will continue to be a challenge, we think, uh, unless people uh, navigate the structural politics that have created a very challenging market to begin with. And with that, um, I will look forward to Saganda's remarks uh, and thank you all for your time. Thank you so much, Danny and David, for those comments and really fascinating set of arguments. I know I have a bursting with ideas and questions and reactions, um, but our first discussant will be uh, Suganda Srivastava, who is a doctoral candidate here at Oxford. She's studying environmental economics, um, and her, she comes to this from a career looking at that topic, both in the academic sense, but also in the, in the policy sense, where she has been an economist and an advisor to companies and to international organizations through her roles at Vivid Economics, and as a trade economist in, based in Delhi. And Sugan is really at the cutting edge of thinking through how we approach this question of creating incentives for especially the hardest to abate sectors transitioning toward a brighter uh, climate friendly future. Um, Suganda, over to you for some discussing comments and then we'll turn to further questions. Great, thanks. Thank you so much, Tom, for that introduction. And I'd also like to thank the Blavatnik School of Govern Government for inviting me. And Danny and David, it was a privilege and honor to read your book. Uh, I enjoyed it greatly and encourage all of the panelists today um, to get a copy and read it. So um, I think that this book is really important in the sense that it opens up with this really important question, which is, what policy mix do you need to address the climate change challenge? And uh, this book comes from a place where it seems like uh, carbon pricing and carbon taxation have uh, been the dominant narrative for so long, but is that all we need? Um, and I think that as Cameron said before, uh, you know, in many of these cases, it's not just an either or question. Uh, you typically need a policy mix. Now, uh, Danny and David uh, give us very strong political reasons for needing this policy mix, but I'd like to emphasize that some of our research at Oxford and um, with my collaborators like Jacqueline Pless at MIT, you know, we show that there's also fundamental economic reasons for needing multiple policy instruments. So while the carbon pricing externality requires, um, while the carbon externality requires carbon pricing, you also have informational asymmetries, you have credit constraints, the social value of innovation is often much higher than the private value of innovation, and there are coordination failures. So all of these other market failures require other instruments as well. Um, so this is the sort of um, kind of holistic thinking we need. And I, I love the fact that this book touches upon that. Um, and just to say, you know, once you think about credit constraints and uh, the fact that the social value of innovation is much higher, you start looking at green subsidies, you start looking at financial instruments to support new green technology and some of these hard to decarbonize sectors. Um, so that's that's kind of an opening remark. Uh, but I also want to uh, touch upon some of the very concrete um, reforms to carbon markets that this book suggests. So I'm going to go through them uh, in order and offer some of my reflections on each. Um, so one of the reforms that uh, Danny and David highlight is that um, there needs to be some sort of carbon price floor uh, in many of our carbon markets. And this stems from a recognition that actually in many carbon markets, prices have been volatile and they've often been quite low such that they don't have a strong impact on businesses' decisions. Um, and I think a lot of economists will agree that we need to design these markets in a way so that they're effective. And if we look at the history of the EU ETS, 
every phase has seen some new design element. So it's been an incremental process of learning. And definitely the idea of a market stability reserve whereby you pull out permits so that you ensure that the price doesn't fall below a certain level is, is a welcome idea. And uh, I like the fact that the book highlights the importance of having this type of carbon price floor. And just to say, uh, this idea is not without its challenges. Uh, the UK tried to implement a carbon price floor uh, in the form of an additional tax and there was backlash against it and it was frozen. Um, so I think one of the things to highlight here is that there's lobbying, not just for carbon markets, but also for carbon taxation and also for industrial policy in the sense that, you know, we see different lobbyists uh, almost fighting uh, and different industries fighting to get higher levels of subsidy. Uh, and then touching upon their next point of offset markets, I think offset markets, um, Danny rightly said that there is a big issue here on how we monitor the additionality of offset markets. So your economics 101 principle will say, well, uh, it's a great idea to link carbon markets and find the least cost emissions reduction. But actually, in practice, how do we ensure that those offsets that are happening abroad reflect additional carbon dioxide reductions. Uh, and that requires thinking about a counterfactual, and that's, that's exceedingly hard to do. Uh, the book also makes a really important point that actually one of the most successful regional carbon market initiatives has been the European Union emissions trading scheme, but that was on the back of a very strong political institutional structure. And that's something that is an important prerequisite. And I think we can all agree that on a global level that prerequisite uh, doesn't exist. And finally, on the offsets question, it does create a moral hazard in terms of local ambition uh, and finding those local solutions. So that's the that's some critique on offset and I think the book makes some really interesting points there. Now, one of the other um, suggestions is limiting the sectoral scope of carbon markets. Now, uh, coming from an economics perspective, I think this is one of the more controversial suggestions of the books. Uh, uh, and the book says that, well, actually, if you have a mix of sectors, then policy ambition can just go down to the lowest common denominator. And that's, uh, as, as David and Danny both said, that's the sort of veto dynamic. Now, I think this is one that we need to think quite carefully about because coming from an economic lens, you'll say, well, actually, uh, there are efficiency gains to having multiple sectors in the market. And actually, the thicker the carbon market is, the more trades you have. And that means it's less sensitive to the initial allocation. So just to give an example, um, you know, even if the glass industry gets a lot of free allowances, uh, so long as it can trade, it knows that if it doesn't sell those allowances, it's losing out on revenue. And so there is this incentive to abate. Uh, so I think we need to think about uh, the best way to kind of deal with special interests. Uh, is it to limit the scope of uh, carbon markets and that comes at a high efficiency cost? Or are there more direct ways to target these special interest groups through sort of uh, democratic reform um, and you know, I'll let the politicians speak more about how we can uh, limit the disproportionate influence of special interest groups. Uh, but just to highlight that there's there's a real economic cost to thinning uh, a market, a, a carbon market. Um, fourth, they talk about the importance of border carbon adjustments and politically uh, competitiveness concerns. Competitiveness concerns have been extremely charged. Uh, lots of industries in Europe have highlighted that if they uh, unilaterally, if Europe unilaterally prices carbon, uh, some industries would just leak out to neighboring uh, countries. And I think the book, you know, it, it it's really important that it highlights the role of border carbon adjustments, the idea that if your trading partner does not have carbon pricing, then you can basically tax their imports. And as a paper by Cameron and Dieter Helm shows that once you have that sort of scheme, it actually incentivizes your trading partners to implement their own carbon taxation schemes so that they can get those revenues domestically rather than send them abroad in the form of um, import duties. Uh, export duties or import. Um, 
And finally, you know, that that leads us to the last point that Danny was making on revenues. And I completely agree here. We need much more accountability on how revenues from market-based instruments uh, or carbon taxation are used. Um, I think that the it, it's astonishing that there isn't more transparency on this. And in fact, I can speak from firsthand experience that uh, digging into some policy documents in India on how the coal cess is used, uh, I was very surprised to find that coal gasification is classified as green spending. So, you know, we need a lot more accountability on how these revenues are used. And just to highlight some ideas there, um, using these revenues for green innovation and especially for pushing through the frontier of green innovation is an extremely important idea. Um, but there's also the idea of using these revenues in um, a redistributive way to make carbon pricing schemes more progressive. So can you give, can you recycle some of those revenues back to your poorest households uh, and ensure that they, uh, there are some social dividends as well? Um, so I think that these are these are important uh, concepts, and I like the fact that uh, they focus on design reforms of market-based instruments. Uh, at the end of the day, um, setting aside. Uh, the political angle, you know, there is also an economic angle to have uh, a multi-focused approach to solving the climate change problem. Uh, and that's sort of, uh, that, that's really important because there are multiple market failures here. And I really like the fact that, um, you know, this type of session brings together the economists and the political scientists. I think it's key to recognize that there are sensitive sectors, that we may need to make carbon taxation and carbon pricing more progressive, and that at the end of the day, for both political and economic reasons, we need a policy mixed bag. Um, so thank you so much for uh, those um, for your book. And I'd also like to say that uh, the last two chapters of the book have a lot of additional policy ideas. So we should also talk about those. Thank you so much, Suganda, for those comments. Um, I know Danny and David probably have a bunch of responses they'd like to bring in. But before we do, let's gather a few more questions. Um, we have a first, the first right of question asking, though, is uh, reserved to our third co-host, third part of Oxford hosting you, the director of the Institute for New Economic Thinking, um, Professor Eric Beinhacker. Eric, if you have a first question, now is, you're very welcome to ask now. Otherwise, we'll begin taking the many questions that are coming in through the, the question and answer function, which you can find in the bottom right corner of the screen. Um, Eric, any question from you, though, to start us off? Yes, uh, thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Tom, and, and thanks uh, to uh, our two authors. Uh, I, I promised uh, uh, earlier on uh, to ask an awkward question, so I'll, I will do my best. Um, uh, this book uh, presents uh, very important empirical evidence on the limited impact that uh, carbon markets have had to date, uh, despite decades of trying. And that raises a broader question of, of maybe we're actually conceptualizing the whole problem in a kind of wrong way that we've been conceptualizing it as a problem of an unpriced externality. And so the answer is price the externality. Uh, but as you guys have shown, that's yielded pretty uh, poor results so far. So maybe going to another point that you made uh, about industrial strategy, that we need to think of the problem itself as one of industrial transformation. How do we move from the energy system we have today to the energy system we need? And we know from history that those kind of transformations tend to happen um, when the new and better stuff gets cheap enough. So, you know, we have lot, lots of cars because Henry Ford made cars get cheap. You know, we have lots of computers because Apple made computers uh, get cheap. And we're seeing in the energy transformation that the biggest carbon impacts have come from the huge declines in prices of solar and wind, and also from the big declines of, of, of natural gas, even though that's not a net zero uh, technology. So uh, my question is, instead of focusing on making the bad stuff expensive, i.e. carbon taxes, maybe policy should focus on making the good stuff cheap. And that's where our political energy should go. And lastly, the politics of that are more attractive because as you guys show and describe, the bad stuff fights back and has political power. Whereas making the good stuff cheap creates new political power to reinforce um, uh, the clean energy transformation. Thanks, Eric. 
Can I ask first, David, to respond to either Eric's question and or any of Suganda's points, and then Danny, feel free to add on top of that. Sure, let me talk about Eric's point, and I'll say a couple of things about Suganda's comments. First of all, I really appreciate these comments and also appreciate the comments that have come in via chat, although some of them are coming in faster than I can type, so I'm gonna stop typing for a little while. Um, I think Eric's formulated the, question, the, the challenge here correctly. I think the challenge is a little bit bigger because if these in, these industrial transformations don't just happen when the new new guys get cheaper, they also require niche markets where early ideas are developed and so on. And and we have in the final chapter of the book some discussion about that, why that's such an important part of industrial policy. I mean, we can think about that in market failure terms, but ultimately you have to go create niche markets, come down the learning curves in that kind of language. And that I think is really important. I do want to emphasize that a well-designed market pricing mechanism has a big role to play here, especially as the new technologies get cheaper, because what they're really good at doing is static optimization. And that's been the UK experience with both your own market and the impact on the power sector. And we see this in the EU market um, when the, in the dark spark uh, uh, spreads where once the technologies are there, the market helps Point, point folks in the, in the correct direction. Uh, I, Sugan, I really appreciated your comments. I want to just pick up on, uh, on, on a couple of them and then hand the floor over to, to Danny. I think the point you made at the top about policy mix, that's right. That's the frontier for us as analysts. Uh, we need to do a better job of modeling a world which doesn't have sim simplified policy instruments, but multiple policy instruments. We happen to think the political economy of that is tractable now analytically, and we've suggested some ways of doing that in the in our in our book. Um, I want to one implication of this is on reforms, and you focus on price floors. I think we're more radical than that, um, uh, which is we'd like price floors and price ceilings, which I think is what we call a tax. And um, and so these efforts to reform cap and trade systems to create tighter collars around pricing to transform them in effect into tax instruments are, are are important. You're right; it's politically hard. A lot of things in life are politically hard. This is a battle worth really focusing on. Whereas some of the other areas where there've been a lot of battles, market links, and so on, we're making the case that that's actually not good political energy spent. But this is an area where the more you can make uh, uh, these mechan market mechanisms into tax-like instruments, the better they play with regulatory and industrial policy instruments. Just, just. Um, uh, two other comments about your very helpful remarks. One is, um, I think you, you put your finger on a central challenge here, which is that if people follow our advice, which is to where you're going to use market instruments, don't try and link all the different sectors together because that in effect creates lowest common denominator. Um, and so we're thinking about this from a political perspective where linking everything together gets you much lower common denominators than you would if you had individual markets. And there's of course a trade-off because you thin the market, exactly as you say. I think we need to focus more on that trade-off and understand better when those, when and how to play those, develop those trade-offs. The last thing I'll say is about border carbon adjustments, which is um, vitally important. I believe the real world border carbon adjustment is gonna be a whole lot harder than people imagine right now, because there a lot of the analysis is being done with idealized price instruments. And when you look closely, even the price instruments are variable across sectors. And then when you look at the real work being done, which is a combination of price and regulation, what you see is kind of more of a dog's breakfast of policy instruments, uh, much harder to figure out exactly what you do at the border about that. Thank you. Thanks, David. Denny, any further thoughts? Just really briefly to go back to, to Eric's question and point, I, I think Eric nailed this question of innovation and industrial transformation being a big part of the problem. Um, and I'll flag when we talk about carbon prices, I don't think we've talked nearly enough about how the revenue side can be mobilized in service of that agenda. I think, again, when we look at the revenue side of these programs, they're not being used very well. And you do need not just these niche market regulatory support structures, but you need money. And a lot of the money is being diverted to things that have nothing to do with climate and often aren't being used very well for whatever social purpose they're, they're purportedly being directed to. So, well, I, I think I'm 100% in agreement with Eric's framing about the core problem we're facing in climate. I think that connection is understudied and really needs to be thought about more carefully if we're gonna keep that engine of innovation moving and build those coalitions. We need revenue to do that, not just broad coalitions for strategy and regulatory support. Um, with respect to Suganda's comments, Suganda, thank you. I, I'm, I'm really honored that you took the time to read this so carefully. We were really hoping for this to be a dialogue with the economics community. I'm half a card-carrying member of that community, 
um, and I think particularly for, for earlier career economists, there's so much work to be done doing great economic thinking applied to political reality. And we have seen, David and I, in, in our careers, potentially with our American bias and all the constructs that come with that, this almost religious attention to idealized carbon pricing systems that I think has kept the best and brightest in the economics community from contributing to their fullest. In the US, I think that's a bigger problem maybe than, than Europe or, or the UK. Um, the last thing I'll mention on this is we are not here to say all carbon prices are bad and don't work. Um, frankly, the European experience today is, is we think the highlight uh, of the global experience. We, we want to emphasize that the political and institutional conditions that have made it possible for Europe to do what it's able to do right now are distinct from anything we observe anywhere else on the planet. And it's really important to keep in the back of our minds to the extent Europe or the UK makes something work with a market-based system, how long it took to get here, how difficult it's been, and the extraordinary capacity in universities and in governments to navigate this absurdly complex change that is delivering results and we should celebrate those results. But I promise you, very sophisticated governments that are not quite as sophisticated as you are will fall flat on their faces if they try and do the exact same thing. And that was a big motivation for our book was again, not to criticize what is working where it is working, but to highlight the contingencies of those success stories so that others follow paths that make more sense. I'll stop there. Thanks, Danny. I, I feel already some, some you know, um, political scientist, economist tensions rising across the, the expanse of Zoom, which is uh, always a, a good sign. Um, let's go now to some questions that are coming in through the question and answer function. I'm going to try to group them into categories if I can, just so we, we uh, make sure we get to as many as possible. So there's a first batch for you, Danny and David, on the model, the model of politics that's at the heart of your, your argument. Let's try to combine some of them together. Nathaniel asks, you know, why do you think that the um, political economy constraints on markets are greater for those kinds of policy instruments than for other kinds of policy instruments. If you can lobby for bad market systems, why can't these interests also lobby for bad industrial policies, say? It's also a question on what are the balances between disincentives versus incentives? Um, and also on in a similar vein on kind of what are the different lobbies for or against good carbon pricing that you think might be um, relevant here and indeed a question of which ones in North America specifically should we be giving money to perhaps if we wanted to support better policies on this. So a bunch of questions around um, the kind of interest group dynamics at the core of the model and also a question related to that asking about the role of voters. So you mentioned voters in the beginning but then um, we didn't hear as much about them in the course of the talk. Can you say a bit more about voters and um, as you are very aware, I think as the entire world is very aware, in a week's time, we'll all be thinking about a particular ec exercise in voting um, in the United States. What role might that uh, potential change have in this debate? We've seen um, some uh, you know, debates in the Democratic Party and the Democratic primary on the value of carbon pricing versus other mechanisms. Um, clearly, it's a split across the, the party. Where do you think carbon pricing would go potentially under a Biden administration? Um, I wonder if we could start with you again, David, and then come back to Danny. Thanks. Um, so let me let me talk about two of those. Uh, the first about the model, and then I want to talk about the U.S. election. Um, so on the model, the purpose of having a simple model is to move beyond, frankly, a lot of the literature in this area, which is some of it says carbon pricing is hard. Others say, well, it's hard, but here's things we could do to make it better. And people have an implicit model of politics, but they haven't been as explicit. And the logic behind this is to create a model that is as simple as possible, but no simpler, and then to show its value and then to invite people to, to, to add, subtract, multiply, divide, to improve the model. So uh, let me talk about a couple elements of the model. One is around the role of visible costs. Uh, this, is, this is an area where voters become very, very important because there are some policies and particular policies that relate to highly visible costs for, for products people consume on a regular basis, like gasoline, for example, where voters are especially sensitive to those kinds of policies. And that's, you know, we, we see this all the time. It's not unique to carbon pricing. And so in that setting, that sensitivity makes it politically much harder <clears throat> to adopt policies, especially policies that work by creating a high incidence and then have a lot of revenue that can be recycled back in various ways. People tend not to focus on the revenue recycling part of it and more on the incidence. What does it mean when you're actually at the pump? 
Uh, and so that's one of the ways that voters come into this model and they help explain why market instruments that, uh, that across multiple sectors and include refined products often end up being watered down to a much lower level than the society actually is willing to pay and, and to in, in, engage. Uh, one of the big advantages of uh, regulatory and industrial policy instruments from a political point of view is the capacity to control the incidence of costs and benefits on different politically organized groups. I'm a political scientist by training, and I think sometimes the economists say they're in the dismal science because they're about trade-offs. I think political science is the real dismal science because we're about how, when you know what all the trade-offs are, people consistently do the wrong thing from an economic point of view. And you know that's life, um, uh, but the more we pretend that's not true, and that's not how real choices get made, the more we talk a lot about climate and don't actually get something done. And that's the big concern of the book. Let me just talk briefly about the elections. Um, I think newsflash, not anybody, or maybe there's one person somewhere in the country is making their voting choice next week based on the climate policies of the two candidates. Um, climate's been in the debates more than at any time in history, um, but the debates have been unusual, shall we say. Uh, I think the really big question is what happens after the election and if Biden wins. Um, to me, what's interesting is two things. One is, There'll be a big push to do the visible things like rejoin Paris, because officially we'll be out the day after the election. But that's easy. What really matters is credibility. And, and having a smarter policy strategy is about improving the credibility of the country so that then other countries see that we're doing something and then we have a more effective co collective effort in this, uh, in, in, in this area. You asked specifically, Tom, about the role of carbon pricing in the Biden plan. I think what's interesting is what Gernot Wagner wrote about in his Bloomberg column a few days ago, uh, commenting in part on our book, which is that we're seeing really a shift away from the pure market strategies towards a much greater role for industrial policy, regulation, and so on, and a little bit of a role for carbon pricing. I think you're going to see exactly that from the Biden people. And it's crucial that we not just talk that game, but we also develop strategies to do regulation effectively so that that doesn't become a you know, kind of giant pork fest. Thanks, David. Danny. I'll just add really briefly to, to bring the voters back in. I think the transportation fuel sector is the sector where the general public's concern is the greatest. Um, and I think there's no better case study of how that sensitivity can destroy the ambition of a carbon pricing system than that of California, which has nominally an economy wide carbon pricing system that is stuck in low gear precisely because the oil industry can run attack ads against anybody with a very visible salient consumer impact. And the mystery of California is no mystery if you understand these politics. How is it that California has a very low price on carbon that does very little to transform anything, but it also has a $200 a ton program that applies to transportation fuels, the very same sector that would lobby you to death if you tried to raise the explicit price on, on, uh, on carbon? The answer is because the visible impacts are salient to everyday voters who know the price of gasoline to the decimal point. Um, and people do not follow and aren't able to translate the complex pathways by which a $200 a ton price signal is refracted through a complex and frankly fairly effective set of policy instruments of the fuel sector side to result in a much lower price impact than its apparent sticker price in terms of dollar per ton impact. The ability of that fuels program to change behavior while minimizing consumer incidents is the key to its success. And it's why you see 10 times the level of ambition of that program relative to an economy-wide program. It's the same issue I spoke to a German policymaker a couple of years ago when the European Union was considering potentially including transportation fuels in the EU ETS. And I said, look, you know, the, the California story is what you need to understand. And if you were to include transportation fuels in your program, that meant any effort to increase the ambition of your program would also take on this added popular dynamic. If you want to add that to the political challenge, if you think European voters are relatively indifferent to transportation fuel changes, go for it. It's great. If you think they are more sensitive to the organizations of industrial sources that are currently regulated and oppose you, consider the liabilities of that economically preferable level of coverage. Um, and that's the practical world that, that political people, I think, have intuited much earlier than, than many of my colleagues in the academy. Um, and I think we need to dialogue with this because if we're going to get the economic efficiencies we seek with these more idealized policies, but we can't get those policies, we need to have other mechanisms to ensure we're getting our economic goals. Um, and that, again, requires looking at a portfolio of instruments, not comparing to an idealized world. Thanks, Buster. Just picking up on this idea of pricing and the, and the mix of policy instruments, um, there's a few questions coming in through around two, two themes. One. Um, 
Danny, you mentioned that you're, you lamented the emphasis on sort of theoretical pricing models amongst economists as opposed to politically constrained versions of those models. Um, and one, I, one manifestation I, I see of that perhaps is um, the number of papers written by economists, political scientists, all of us on carbon pricing could, you know, could sink a, could sink a windmill, <laughs> if that's an expression. Um, but the number of, of papers written about fossil fuel subsidies or uh, in other words, negative pricing is, you know, a tiny, tiny fraction of that, even though this is arguably a larger policy instrument in terms of the raw economic um, impact of them. So is, how does this uh, uh, negative pricing policy fit into, into your argument? Is this something that you think is a ripe candidate for the policy mix, or is it constrained by the kinds of um, political factors that you, you've mentioned? And on that as well, um, Jacqueline asks about the role of supporting re renewable energy. Um, so you mentioned the importance of channeling revenue toward um, these kinds of things. But Jacqueline's question you know, invites you to reflect a bit more on whether, um, you know, how do we actually mobilize sufficient resources for that kind of development? And can you say more about the political challenges of those kinds of alternative instruments um, alongside the sort of subsidy question? So, so um, maybe just to reverse the order, Danny, maybe if you could want to start with those things, and then David will hear any further thoughts you might have. Just briefly, I, I think we so we don't deal explicitly with fossil fuel subsidies in the book. I think that's an essential question. And please don't hear me as, as beating up on the economics community. It's, it's quite the opposite. If I if an, a young economist came to me and said, what should I study carbon pricing or fossil fuel subsidy reform? I know the answer to that question. Fossil fuel subsidy reform is a huge and important deal. The insights from economists to navigate these issues critically important. And I think we need to be thinking a lot more about subsidy coalitions, both for the incumbents who have the bad subsidies who do, that do bad things, as well as the new entrants we want to see grow in size. And I'll just emphasize again, most of the new firms that are coming into being focus on lobbying for subsidies and regulatory support, not carbon pricing. Because if you have one lobbyist as opposed to the incumbents 100 lobbyists, you're going to ask that one lobbyist to focus on the thing that is tractable and in front of you. Um, the last piece, uh, the last point I want to make on this is, is back to Eric's question. When you think about the industrial transformation process, once an industry gets big enough that it's very good at lobbying for its own activities, and I would say in the United States, for example, our renewable energy industries are mature enough that they lobby pretty well for their interests. You might say we should help more or less depending on your point of view, but they're not fledglings anymore. One of the concerns I have is outside of wind and solar, there aren't very many industries that are mature enough to put up a big enough fight when it comes to serious budgetary politics. And that's why thinking about dedicated revenue sources as an ongoing revolving transformative fund is an important piece of the innovation and, and de development puzzle that um, I think is distinct from the question of how large incumbents or relatively mature new entrants start to lobby for those same public subsidies. Thanks, David, for your thoughts. Thanks. Um... So two things. First, Jacqueline's question about um, what do we learn from renewables and how to create that industry uh, and so on. I just want to emphasize what Danny said here, that the, the politics are plastic. They're dynamic. So um, early on, you are in effect, what you're doing is you're not just creating the, the green shoots of a new industry. You're also creating the green shoots of a new political interest group. And of course, as they get bigger and more powerful, they can also do pernicious things, but you're, you're just dead politically if you don't have supporters. Um, this is a terrific study that we cite about the history of the German solar program, which begins you know, with small amounts of money going to universities and other people wearing Birkenstocks and so on and kind of working on new technology. And then they become more successful and they gain a little bit of market share and more power and they become more powerful. And so that, that's the dynamic theory of politics that's sitting in the background here. Those of you who are big fans of new, new trade theory, you could imagine building a simple model of, that's in effect a, a new, new trade model, but applied to, to, to industrial transformations. And, and I think that would be the right way to think about this, this, this question. Subsidy reform, absolutely crucially important. Um, a few years ago, Gabriel and Shasta at the World Bank and I led an effort to look at the politics of subsidy reform, which is something of keen interest to the World Bank because an awful lot of money was being spent by governments on, on energy related subsidies that they could spend on other things. And one of the things that really struck me is, is so we had a theory, simple theory of politics, actually very similar to the theory of politics we had in this book. It only had two variables instead of seven, but a uh, very simple theory of politics, very powerful, I think, um, but also a bunch of case studies. And what's really striking to me is how many governments have learned how to 
reform these subsidies, identify which political interest groups are manageable with side payments, if you like, which are untouchable because if you touch them, you blow up. And then also how to deal with some of the adverse consequences like, like impacts on low-income consumers through uh, smart cards and direct payments and things like that. And 10 years ago, 20 years ago, that would have been much harder. Today, it's much easier. And I think that's actually a sign of just tremendous progress. And we need to take more of that playbook and apply it to fossil fuel subsidies. Thanks. Suganda, you had a point on this, on this topic. Yeah. Um, so, so on this, uh, on, on Jacqueline's sort of question, um, you know, Danny, I'm, I'm, I'm working with a political scientist, Ryan Rafferty, uh, who's also based at Oxford, and we are, uh, we're thinking about sort of what are the strategies uh, here, and I think you know there there are almost three that come to mind that are quite important and that encapsulate some of the discussions here. So Eric mentioned making green technology cheaper, so that's the countervalence idea. At the same time, when it comes to removing fossil fuel subsidies that's a form of appeasement to this very strong lobby and the special interest group. Uh, and finally, something that's also mentioned in the book, which I think um, we should talk about is uh, reputational costs and antagonism and pen the concept of penalty, uh, sort of penalty defaults that's in the book. And I think, you know, a mix of countervalence, making renewables cheaper, uh, appeasement, paying off some of the losers, and finally antagonism, which is increasing these reputational costs. Uh, a, a mix of those strategies could be a, a way forward. Um, and we have a upcoming paper on this. So um, check it out at the Smith School website in, in a few weeks. Thanks, Suganda. We'll be looking out for that one. Um, so a bunch of questions have come in looking also at the international dimensions. And some of you have already mentioned border carbon adjustments and other parts of it, but let me put these into a package if I could. Um, so someone asked about the role of uh, international carbon trading, particularly the clean development mechanism, the core um, carbon market created by the Kyoto Protocol. Um, and noting this was for some developing countries, a useful tool of bringing revenue for climate activities to them. So if we are thinking about carbon markets internationally, is that a channel for thinking about the kinds of international financial transfers that we'll certainly need to have a global solution to climate change? Um, you mentioned already border, border carbon adjustments, um, but I wonder if there's, um, if we are looking at a world where border carbon adjustments become of higher political salience, which certainly could be the case as we see the EU and the Biden campaign and others beginning to talk a lot more about that kind of tool. Would that then change the politics around carbon pricing? Uh, would it make it more attractive it, specifically if you could say, well, we can meet your border carbon adjustment because our price is X and your, your tariff is, is X and so they're their equivalent. And would that be a lot easier to do with something that looks like carbon pricing, a lot harder to do with something that looks like industrial policy? So if we move to a BCA world, is that gonna put a bit more of a finger on the scales toward pricing? Um, and finally, I wonder if you have any suggestions around how the final piece of the Paris Agreement puzzle to be negotiated, the so-called Article 6 negotiations, which are about uh, market transfers, how could an outcome there influence this debate? Is there something that you might hope that that kind of um, the, the Paris Agreement on uh, Article 6 creates for carbon pricing that's going to make them work better? And then on conversely, are there some risks there where a bad outcome on Article 6 could um, emphasize some of the negative trends you found already. Um, David, can we start with you? Sure, let me just talk about Article 6 and then go to Danny for the other questions I can come back. Um, I think this is an area of disagreement between our way of seeing the world and where a lot of attention is focused. If Article 6 becomes, in effect, is seen as the license for linkages between different markets and so on, and some more of that's going to happen because of border carbon adjustments, I think politics of that are very clear. I'm sure Daniel will have more to say about the border carbon adjustments. But fundamentally, <clears throat> this is like creating a new form of money. And so your money is only as good as the quality and stability and reliability of the institutions that back your trading system or your carbon pricing mechanism. And that's why Europe has been successful because you have all those institutions in place um, for doing that. And that's why all the other linkages between markets have failed. And I, I think that's this whole 
maybe a little more extreme later in the day, as it were. I think it's a whole Article Six movement is just a fool's errand. Let me hey. add on to that. I think we we didn't talk in our presentation about market links, which is something we spend quite a bit of time on in the book. It relates to both revenue and, and something we haven't talked about yet in our discussion, which is carbon offsets. And it all comes back to Article Six. So let me let me tie it together this way. Um, we hear a lot of discussion about people saying links between a carbon market system and another market system or an offset project outside of that system or sending revenue to a global public good. These are potential ways to engage these other interesting areas of climate policy. And I think for the most part, these, these approaches, while well-intentioned, get the politics backwards. The politics of pricing is about domestic interests. It's not about global public goods. Um, and by that, I mean, if you want to have a market link, the question of whether or not that market link is gonna be feasible is answered by the question of how the domestic interests in the two sides will be affected by the market link and the transactions that occur as a result of it. Um, same thing on the revenue side, you asked about sending some money to, you know, to international matters. Very difficult to send money abroad when interests at home prefer to keep it at home. And again, I think when you look carefully at how the, the political processes work for those appropriations, they keep the money at home. It's very rare to send them abroad. Last thing to say on Article 6 is, you know, there's obviously uncertainty about where the Article 6 negotiations are going. There's nothing stopping people from linking programs and markets to demonstrate a concept of what they'd like to see. Um, and again, we spend quite a bit of time in the book showing that basically every market link outside of the European system is fairly superficial and is not evidence of the potential for this to scale, but we think actually evidence of the very limited conditions under which market links can occur outside of the robust institutional governance structure that the European Union has as a whole. Um, and again, we don't see very many supranational entities like the European Union government that are capable of doing that. And to just hammer the point home, the only link we are aware of that includes a jurisdiction that is a climate leader and a jurisdiction whose leaders oppose climate policy is the link between Germany and Poland in the context of the European Union. Until you can show the politics of how a recalcitrant state is induced or enticed to participate in a carbon pricing system that has leaders in it, I think the potential for linking to be a, a driver of progress rather than a codification of basically comparable ambition is pretty limited. Thanks. Cameron, I wonder if you had any further thoughts on the question of order carbon adjustments in Article 6 since you've thought a lot about these topics. Uh, sorry to put you on the spot, but I thought you couldn't, you probably would have a few things to add. Um, thanks, Tom. Yeah, look, I mean, I think I, I feel that the uh, the incentives that are created when you have a border carbon adjustment, as, as we've just heard, in terms of triggering other countries to put either export tariffs or actually going the whole hog and putting carbon prices on domestically, they're so appealing. Uh, and they really play to the work that Don Farmer and Eric and others have been doing, looking for uh, interventions in the system that have amplifying effects that trigger these kind of feedbacks or a domino effect. And so it's for that reason that for a very long time, you know, I and others at Oxford, in fact, I think there are a lot of people, this is one of the few things that people broadly agree on. I say that with hesitance, but I, I think actually, you know, it, they're just a very appealing strategy. Um, it's difficult to get them in place because, uh, you know, it takes us quite a lot of spine. I mean, we saw with the European approach to aviation that we had a mechanism in place. They were lobbied very heavy, heavily diplomatically by the Indians, by the Americans, by the Chinese, and you ultimately backtracked a bit. Well, we look like we're about to have another round this year. Uh, my sense is that countries, regions, spines are stiffening on this issue because it's actually increasingly recognized across the board that there's something in it for everyone in creating this kind of club. I mean, I, I use the word club because that is in a sense what, what emerges. It's a, it's a trading regime and it, it, it uh, relates to Bill Nordhaus's idea uh, of a carbon pricing club. Now, you know, to Danny and David's point, I don't think this gives you some kind of nirvana of universally harmonized carbon prices around the world, but, but in patchwork, bottom-up kind of style, it, it probably leads you to getting something more useful. But I, you know, fundamentally, I think, I think the point of the book is right, that we should do what we can here, but we shouldn't expect carbon pricing to do all the job or, or even most of the heavy lifting.
Thanks, Cameron. So, uh, David, please. Can I just jump in on this? First of all, I appreciated Cameron pausing when he said this is an area where we agree because I feel like whenever we identify something we agree on in the social sciences, it's got to be wrong because we disagree on everything. And I think you're exactly right, though. This is one of those areas where we just think about the raw incentives. This is an area of a really emerging agreement. I think the, the club goods logic applies whether you're using industrial policy and regulation or whether you're using market instruments. It may be a little more powerful than market instruments because the commodity consequences of getting prices wrong are, are greater. But, but the one, one of the reasons why we in the book are, are pushing on border carbon adjustments is because you need that. If you're gonna make big reductions in emissions, especially in the trade exposed industry, you've gotta have some way of dealing with the trade effects. I think an open question right now is whether the complexity and difficulty of doing BCAs with with regulatory instruments where nobody really knows what the marginal cost and whether that complexity is not gonna create a little more of an advantage for market-based instruments because of the simplicity of applying the border measures. And I, I think that's an open question right now, but that's plausible and that could be very interesting. Just really briefly to add, you know, I think that's right. And if you go sector by sector, industry by industry, the story is much easier. So I'm quite skeptical that if Europe were to push a border adjustment that very many people would adopt multi-sector carbon pricing policies in response, the notion that people might say, okay, we're gonna work on steel, we're gonna figure out steel, and a club of countries might start to think about steel, that makes a lot more sense to me precisely because the politics are more tractable, the more focused you are. And I think as David said, the logic applies to regulations and to prices. And to the extent the pricing makes that international cooperation easier, great. It just won't make it easier for multi-sector economy-wide pricing. Great, really helpful discussion. So a few questions have come in around, um, if you will, different kinds of characteristics of jurisdictions that might make them better or worse at, at managing the trade-off of how to fit carbon pricing into the mix of policies in an optimal way. Um, so Vivian mentions the role of administrative capacity, particularly in developing countries, noting that many uh, developing countries have sought more simple solutions, simple policy measures, because there's a huge regulatory burden for some kinds of pricing mechanisms, but maybe not. Maybe they could be done in a, in a way, um, particularly if, if you're talking about carbon taxes, which you're not in the book, but um, in a different way that could be quite simple to apply. So is there um, a sort of nuanced set of recommendations you'd make created by administrative capacity? Second related questions around um, regime type. So we have a potentially very large carbon market emerging in China, um, but obviously that system has taken longer to develop than was maybe first planned and has, has um, shown a number of, of hiccups on, on its route forward. However, I would note that in a speech just uh, two weeks ago and uh, the Chinese environment minister drawing on Xi Jinping's surprise 2060 announcement, you know, reiterated that the ETS in, in China will be an important part of their path to 2060 climate neutrality. So um, is there some kind of you know, regime type interaction here that we should be aware of? Is carbon pricing of different kinds easier or harder um, in, a, in a country like China versus a place like the European Union or California? Um, and the final point that's come through is on subnational actors. So um, is, there, is pricing um, better or worse, if you will, um, for countries to do, or can it be done effectively uh, or less effectively by different kinds of actors as well. California maybe is a, a very large one, but we also see, for example, carbon pricing schemes in, in you know, city level in Tokyo, for example. So is that a, a viable way forward? Um, Danny, can we start with you and then go, come to David? Sure, um, I think the subnational question is an interesting one. We, we talk in the book, just as a reminder, subnational governments don't have a lot of legal authority. So where they have a tractable handle, um, a, a jurisdiction like California can regulate its own fuels and electricity pretty well. Um, so it's not that you can't do anything, but it's very difficult to coordinate and create legally binding cooperation between subnational actors. And that's why we see basically the cooperation between subnational actors is very thin. So to the extent a subnational actor has a handle, a legal handle on some portion of emissions that's relevant, cities often do not outside of their building sector uh, and their, their local transportation sectors. Um, that's fine, but it's really hard to tell a story about deepening ambition precisely because subnational governments can't sign treaties with one another. There's very little that can be done to legally codify anything. Um, I think this administrative capacity question is, is really central. Uh, I'm struck at the parallels between California and Europe. 
which I think are on the very high end of the administrative capacity side and yet show, I think, extreme differences in their overall capacity to manage complicated questions. I don't have like a final answer as to how countries that are really struggling with, with administrative capacity exactly what they should do, other than I promise uh, a trading-based system is going to overwhelm the complexity of most. Um, taxes are a little easier because you, you just have to have an emissions inventory and an accountability system for enforcement, which is not a small thing at all, but you don't have to have a team of 20 economists running models and scenarios to figure out what the price is going to be. Um, so I do think simplicity is very much a virtue in these discussions, and, and we need to return to that focus as we think about, again, Europe is at the lead on this stuff. What Europe and the UK can do is often not at all the question you want to ask in the context of many other economies and governments. Um, and I think we need to keep that in mind because there's a path dependency on the trading side in Europe that um, I don't think is one you necessarily want to repeat in other jurisdictions. David? Yeah, thank you very much. I agree with that. Um, <clears throat> on the point of leverage on subnational level, um, we released a study from the team I lead at Brookings um, last week. It looked at all the top cities that are doing stuff in the United States. Well, it turns out half of them are doing nothing, but the other half that are doing something. They do a lot of stuff. They're 4% of US emissions. So I think the way to think about the cities is that they are running experiments, they're pioneers. And there are ways of learning what's doable, what's not doable, what works, what doesn't work. And then the key is to move beyond the pioneers to, to wider diffusion. I'm just mindful of the time. I want to say one thing about China. <clears throat> A lot of attention to the Chinese carbon market. It's like a little bit like a Rorschach test. If you believe that the market instrument's doing a lot of the work, you see the Chinese carbon market, you're thrilled. When you look behind the system, the 20, there's a lot going on in China around the 2060 target and in earlier efforts and the big efforts to improve efficiency and then reduce dependence on coal, which predates the 2060 target. Huge amount of effort going on. That's not happening with the carbon market. And I think folks who think the carbon market's doing that work are just smoking and inhaling some amazing product. Uh, hopefully trading the emissions of that product then uh, other ways. Um, great, so we're coming toward the end of our time together. Um, so if there's any last pointing questions, please do urgently type them into the chat. Um, I wanna go back though and ask all of the commentators and the authors to come back to a kind of core point, which is what's the most likely or the best conditions under which carbon pricing is going to be the best option or the, amongst the best options? And when would it be the least good? So could we define a kind of simple decision set of tools for governments thinking, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced I'm going to do some climate policy. Um, what should I do? When would, be, when would you be most likely to recommend carbon pricing as part of their policy mix? When would you say, mm, think again, try to come to that one later? Um, but could I go, first go back to um, the various commentators to offer any f final thoughts on the argument, um, just very briefly in the interest of time, and starting with um, Eric, if I could. Um, well, in the in the interest of time, I'll just simply say this has been a fascinating uh, discussion, and uh, to uh, thank both the authors and and, and panelists. Thank you, Eric. Um, Suganda. Sure. Um, so I think that's a really important question. And uh, in terms of when carbon pricing uh, can be a good instrument, uh, I think that if we introduce it as a policy package and put in place the right, um, the right ways to distribute carbon pricing revenue, then I think in many contexts, it can be a fantastic scheme. Um, and I think that we need the way we communicate carbon pricing is is really key. So I think talking about how international financing for coal is drying up, and then telling citizens that actually, these carbon pricing revenues will go back to you in a progressive way, that that can be a very powerful tool. And I think more countries should be experimenting with that sort of communication and that sort of design. Thanks, Uganda. Uh, Cameron. Thanks, Tom. Uh, and thanks, Danny and David. Look, it's a great book. And I think for me, the closing comment is that what we want to do is do what this book is doing, which is to be pragmatic and strategic and thoughtful about how we're using different instruments. We don't have time to kind of stuff around anymore to adhere to specific ideological or theoretical positions. It, it is now, I mean, it should have always been, but it is now definitely is what is going to work. 
And for me on carbon pricing, this, as Sagan has just said very rightly, it's about seeing it, uh, as I say, pragmatically as part of a package, focusing on the politics, thinking about the public acceptability, and that's also you know, the, the story about the communications. Uh, you know, and a lot of that is in the um, in the Nature Climate Change paper that I've posted in the in the chat. But but you know, far more of it is in this book. So thank you guys for for writing the book, uh, and thank you for coming along here to share your insights this evening. Thanks, Cameron. Um, so Danny, and then David, your thoughts then on where we should see carbon pricing the most likely case for it and the least likely case for it, and any final comments you might have. I've spent the better part of my young professional life working on carbon pricing. And I, it's very difficult for me to say I've seen much of it work as much as I would like to say there's a lot of prospect for it. I'm not an opponent of carbon pricing. I think where you can get it done is great, but I think the place to get it done is when it is a complement to other strategies. And particularly when there is a coherent view about how the revenue is gonna be used to accelerate progress in one of multiple goals. Um, and I think I would draw just a, a brief distinction with Sugandha's perspective. I've worked actually on a bill to recycle most of California's carbon revenues back to people to create a progressive economic outcome. And environmental justice advocates loved it and everybody else hated it because the diffuse public benefits there really weren't up to the task of surmounting the opposition from the oil industry in that jurisdiction. So it's not that I don't think that that approach is a desirable one. It's that I think realistically carbon prices are gonna be lower than we need them to be. And therefore what we should be thinking about on the revenue use is not massive social and economic policy, which we should be doing, but how to create tangible wins for groups or outcomes that we view the carbon pricing instrument as a key support policy to. And so dedicating a chunk of money to childhood services for low-income communities is gonna be way more impactful from an equity point of view than broad-based revenue recycling spending that money on R&D and deployment to address some of the concerns Eric has raised, far more impactful from a climate point of view. And I think those are the sorts of blunt, you know, conversations we need to have. When you can have those conversations, carbon pricing can be an important part of the policy mix. Thanks, Danny. David, last thoughts. Yeah, so first I think Cameron summarized it very nicely. Um, you know, we gotta be focusing on what works and developing theories to explain that and debating those. And we welcome people to critique what we've done here. Let me be crisp. Where does it work best? Works best when you're in areas where you have mature technologies and business models, and you have basically carbon tax kinds of model, carbon tax kinds of systems. And it could well be that in those areas, the carbon pricing does most of the work. Uh, it's just we don't see a lot of that right now in terms of the deep decarbonization needed. Where does it work? Where is it going to be the worst? It's going to be in in political systems where there are, where there are political landmines sitting across different sectors, and where connecting everything together into single pricing schemes guarantees those landmines go off and it harms your system politically. And it's going to be particularly bad when you're dealing with early stage innovative over the horizon technologies where the, the, the marginal price is not what drives uh, the incentives to invest in, in new, new ideas. So we just have to keep those models in mind. My read of the climate problem is that 75 to 80% of the problem, maybe more is of the latter category right now and not the former category and hence um, our perspective in this book. Thank you very much to Oxford, all the arms of Oxford for hosting us today. Thank you, David. Thank you, Danny. Thank you for writing this book. It, to remind everyone, it's called Making Climate Policy Work, and it's available uh, in Europe, at least now, and soon in the US. And thank you both for, um, for writing it and, and inspiring this great conversation today. Thank you all for joining us uh, here on the virtual Blavatna School book launch what, um, site. Um, and this will be available afterwards for anyone who wants to share it as well. Um, please all join me in a round of applause for the authors and the commentators tonight. And thank you all again for joining us. Thank you all.